You know, there are sermons that are quite literally fun to preach. I love to preach through the Psalms. I love the Psalms. And there are sermons that are hard to preach. This morning is going to be one of those. Now, as Charles Spurgeon said, when you preach about heaven, let your face light up like the glories of heaven. He said, when you preach about hell, your normal face will light up. But, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse 10, it says, verse 11, excuse me, it says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place before them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Let us pray. Lord, as we look at this passage this morning, we do so with no joy. But we know that it is true. It is true as the truth about heaven and the glories and the wonders of our Redeemer. It is true. And one day it will come to pass. And I pray that we as believers might be mindful of its truthfulness and of, it, and of its future fulfillment. And Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's never put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that the Spirit of God might put a holy terror in their heart. That they would repent and trust in the Lord Jesus. Use this message for your glory and for our benefit. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I see four words in this passage that I think outline it very nicely. It's very easy to remember. First thing we see here is the judge. It says, And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it from whose face in the earth and the heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. You know, the world likes to talk about the Jesus that healed the sick raise the dead. And I'd like to talk about him too. And over and over the Bible tells us that he was moved with compassion. And there are other times where although that expression is not used, it's obvious that he had great compassion. Jesus was a man for the common people. The Bible is a book for the common people. I think it was Lady Sutherland of the early Methodist movement says that she was saved on the basis of an M, the letter M, where it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, not many noble. It didn't say not any, but not many. She was nobility. The gospel is offered to whosoever will, but as we well know, the rich and the famous and the powerful tend to avoid it. It's not something that they find palatable. Jesus went about in His ministry here on earth with the smiles and compassion. He spoke to the people gently. The only ones that He was rough on were the hypocrites the religious hypocrites, the scribes and the Pharisees who rejected God's Word and added to that and made it as binding, in many cases more binding than the very Word of God. And He cleansed the temple on two occasions, at the beginning of His ministry and just before His crucifixion. And both times there was anger because He was righteous. Now there are those who say, well, how could a loving God send anyone to hell? Good question. And if God were only loving, that would be a valid one. But God is also holy. 
We see here the vision, visage of the Lord Jesus Christ marred by rage and anger. This is the anger of justice. You know, we tell the people we like justice. We want justice for the other guy. We want mercy. You say, well, what happened to, to the mercy of God? What happened to the grace of God? We well, see, there's a time frame for that. We now live in the age of grace. We live in the time of God's mercy. But that time will come to an end. What we see here, and we'll see in, in just a moment, is these are people that are raised from the dead. There is no mercy. There is no grace for the dead that reject the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, who is this person? Why you say, Pastor, how do you know that this is Jesus? Well, he said in John 12, 48, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him. No, excuse me, I'm sorry. John 5, 22 says, And the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. This is the Lord Jesus Christ, that one who in His ministry here on earth demonstrated such grace and such compassion and such mercy. But the time of mercy is ended. The, the day of grace is over. This is the time of God's judgment on sin. Now who will be there? And the next verse speaks of the judged. We see first the judge and now we see the judged. It says, it says and I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. It tells us in verse 13, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. I saw the dead small and great. And this doesn't mean the little and the big. It means the nobodies and the somebodies. You know, I love the uh, little House on the Prairie books. I, I don't know much about the program. I didn't see it, but I love the books. And Paul said in, in his book, uh, he said in one of the books, he says, the rich have their ice in the summer and the poor have theirs in the winter. Now, there are people who would like to make this world more equal. But it doesn't work that way. I am convinced that if we took all the money of the world and we divided it equally, that with rare occasions in five years, the people that have it would have it back and the people that don't wouldn't have it anymore. Okay? There are reasons why people are poor. Sometimes it's their system. You know, the American system has created greater wealth than any system in the history of the world. Now, it's not equal. Because an equal system does not create wealth, it destroys it. But then they're powerful people. I mean, real power. And, and, and folks, we live in an age when the power has be, is being abused greatly. There are people that ought to be in jail. There are people that ought to be behind bars. But I know they're, they're rich. They're famous. They're influential. they got the right kinds of friends. And they can avoid that. But you know what? There will come a time. And this is a great comfort to me. There will come a time when nothing that they have, nothing that they say, no one that they know will be able to keep them from the judgment of God. And you know, the beautiful thing about the judgment of God is it is perfect. It is perfect. Now, now I, I, I love history. And down through history, there have been times when the justice was not just, the so-called justice was not just. The rich got away with their, with their, their crimes, the poor and sometimes were innocent and they were dealt a terrible injustice. But the justice of God is perfect in that first of all, it is for it is for every person. It is also perfect because only God's justice perfectly fits the sin. You know, there have been times when you got a hor horrible things for a small crime. And there were times when, you see, only God, only God is a. Yeah, I, I was reading last, uh, just a few days ago, and, and actually I have been there at Auschwitz in, in Poland. 
there's a there's a gibbet there. There's a there's a gallows, and there are different kinds of gallows. They're the kind of gallows that they fall out, you fall free, and you breaks your neck and you're gone. But there's also another kind of gallows where they just kick the something out, a bucket or something out from you, and you just hang there for like about five minutes. But this is that kind, and that's where they hung Rudolf Hess. Rudolf Hess was the commandant of Auschwitz. And, and, and he, he is believed to be responsible for the murder of about 3 million people. Of the 6 million Jews that died in the Holocaust, or in the Shoah as, as, the, as the Jews call it, a million and a half of them were children. When they came into Auschwitz, there was standing Dr. Mingala and different other doctors, and he would point this to the left went to the gas chambers, to the right went to the work camps. Almost many of the women went to the left, all of the, the old went to the left, all of the children went to the left, the others went to the work camps. There is no way, they, they hung Rudolf Hess, but you see folks, is that was the greatest justice that mankind could mete out. God's justice will be complete. I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. Then we see the judging. The judging. First, the judge. Secondly, the judged. Thirdly, the judging. How does this judging go? It tells us here, in verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those, out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now there are two sets of books mentioned here, and there's one other book mentioned somewhere else. So there are three books. Now obviously, using old uh, first century understanding, these were scrolls. These were not books like your Bible. Now, by the way, uh, the, the word Bible comes from the Greek word biblion, which means book. These books were opened. In other words, it was time to reveal what was in them. You remember earlier in the, the book of Revelation, there was this seven sealed book. Now, I find it interesting is if you if you look at a an illustration of it, you've got the book with seven seals. No, that's not the way it worked. Okay? Not the way at all. Okay? Because you see, you had to break a seal to go to the next thing. So in the the, the first seal was on the outside, the other six were on the inside of the scroll, and you had to break that seal to find out what was being said. So when the books are open, the revelation is made. And here there are three books. First of all, there's the book of works. The book of works. Then secondly, there's something known as the book of life. And then thirdly, there's a book described in John chapter 12 and verse 48. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judges him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. There is the book of the Word of God. You see, the Word of God is the standard. The Word of the God. It's the, the standard is not some church. It's not some preach, uh, priest. It's not some preacher. It's not some council. It's not some denomination. It's not some religion. It is the Word of God. Like it, lump it, whatever. It doesn't matter. That is the standard. And that is what will be used to judge a person in that day of judgment. Now when this judgment is made, it will be the judge, going back to the judge for just a minute, the judge in the judgment. What, is it, what does the Bible tell us? Well, in Psalm 139, it's tells us that God knows our thoughts even before we think them. Our thoughts are far off. 
In other words, God from eternity past has known the thoughts that you are going through your mind right this very minute. He has always known. It tells us in Proverbs, the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. In Jeremiah it says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him, said the Lord? Do not I feel heaven and earth, said the Lord. God knows everything. In the New Testament it says, That which is whispered in the closet which shall be shouted from the rooftops. You have nothing, nothing, nothing in your life that God doesn't know about. Every rascally deed, every filthy deed, every awful thought, every hateful thought, every dirty thought, every thought of any kind which is not pleasing to the Lord. He knows our acts. He knows our motivation. He knows everything. That's the book of our works. It will all be open. Now, I don't know exactly in what order this is going to be done, but this is how it's going to work. I, I think the first book that will be open perhaps is the Bible, but the the, and possibly the second book is this one. Verse 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So here, that is the determination of what happens, where the person goes. Now, it's my understanding from, from Scripture that this is all... Are we going to be there to watch? I don't know. We don't know. Some people try to take, take uh, Matthew 25 and say, then shall we say, the left hand depart from me, curse the everlasting fire, and the right hand depart from me in the joys of the Lord, uh, or, or enter into the joys of the Lord. I don't know if we're going to be there or not. But this judgment is not about, this is not a general judgment. This is the judgment of the law. So the place is already determined. And perhaps people will be able to go and to look, look through that scroll and try to find their name. I don't know. But then there will be another determination. This is not a determination of whether a person goes to the lake of fire or not, but I believe rather the severity of the punishment. says they would judge every man according to their works. Now why would they would judge every man according to their works? Because God knew who they were and He knew where they were going. And the works would determine the severity. Now I don't know how this works. That's, that God does not reveal this. But the Bible says it has the idea of many stripes. Many get, observing many stripes. Get many stripes. And so somehow, some way, God will regulate the severity of this punishment. Not the duration, but the severity. And it says, And whosoever is not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. John 3.36 says, He that trusteth in the Son has life. He that trusteth in the Son has life. You see, folks, there was a day, there was a day when the love of God and the, and the holiness of God met and they were both satisfied. And that was at the cross. That was at the cross. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And what Jesus endured on the cross was spiritual, physical, emotional. It was a holistic torture. And involved in that was the wrath of God, His Father on the Son. There was the spiritual torture in that He was separated from the Father. From eternity past, this had never occurred. When Jesus said in the Garden of Eden, excuse me, the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, the Lord uh, said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. This was not just His humanity speaking. This was His whole being. Because God, oh, no one could suffer as much as Jesus did as a human being. 
For He suffered as divinity. He suffered as God. He suffered because He became the bearer of sin. Of folks, if you if you ever been in a place where you could feel the wickedness, the evil, I've been there. It's very uncomfortable. And I'm a fallen man. The perfect, absolutely perfect Son of God became the bearer of all the sin from the first sin of Adam and Eve until the last sin committed. I, I truly believe that He died for all mankind. And is mankind's decision to accept or reject that atonement, that sacrifice that was made. Amen. Now also at the cross was God's holiness. And it tells us in Isaiah 53, 11, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. When Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father except by me. This is not bigotry. This is not some kind of... You know what this is? This is the absolute truth. Because no one else can make an atonement for my sin. I can't. Now you can't make an atonement for yours. If they took us and nailed us to a cross, that we would not atone for our own sin because we are not a perfect sacrifice. We have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmity, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. And that is what is necessary to provide a sacrifice which pleases the Father. John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. You see, He was God's sacrifice. And He was morally perfect. Absolutely without sin. And therefore His death could purchase for you and I the gift of eternal life. But I cannot. I cannot. Oh, what, what does the Bible say about our good works? All oh, our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. This rag not only was dirty, but it stunk. And those who think that they can pile their good works and add it to the perfect atonement of the Lord Jesus Christ, blaspheme God and blaspheme the Son. You are not. Nothing you do, nothing you do can commend you with an additional millimeter to God. Our good works are repugnant. Now I say, well, then I'll just live the way I want to. No, that's not the way it works. You see, everybody who thinks they're going to heaven is trusting in something. They are. If you ask somebody, oh, do you think you're going to go to heaven? Well, I hope so. Well, uh, and I push a little hard. Well, what, what, why do you think you might go to heaven? Oh, well, I'm a pretty good person. Does pretty good do it? <laughs> I'm afraid not. But that's what they're trusting in. And John 3.36 says, He that believeth. The, word, the Greek word believe means to trust. He that trusteth in the Son has life. He that trusteth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth in him. So let's have none of this. How could a loving God send anyone to hell? The loving God loved you on Calvary. It was His love that held Him there. It was His love that kept Him there on the cross until everything that had been foretold in the Old Testament was complete. And then He surrendered His life. His resurrection, it says we raised for, by, for His... For his, he was raised for our justification. What that means is his, his resurrection demonstrated to all of us that God was pleased with what the Son had done.
we've seen the judge, that one who once had shown such great love and compassion, but now, by virtue of his perfect holiness, must exercise justice on sin, whose face is marred by the absolute commands of God that have been trashed by the world, by these people that are before him. Then we see the judged, the people that will be there, the small, the great, the, the, the little people, the nobodies and the somebodies. God will make no exception. There is nothing that anyone can do to prevent themselves being there apart from putting their faith in the Lord Jesus. So we see the judge, the judged, the judging, the works that they cannot hide, the thoughts that are completely visible to an all-knowing God, the motives that stink, the abuse of one another. Oh my, I have read the history of this world and it is a sorry commentary on the corruption of, man, of humankind. Then we see the judgment. The judgment. May I say to you this morning that those who reject God's way of salvation leave God no options. It is Jesus or hell. Simple as that. What does the Bible tell us about this place? Well, in Matthew chapter 13, verse 42, it says there shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Another place it says weeping. Weeping, wailing, and gnashing of teeth. People said that this describes the degrees of their suffering. I don't know. Matthew 25, 30 says outer darkness. You ever notice when it's dark it amplifies the terror, danger? You know, you... When it's dark, and it, this is outer darkness. How you say, Pastor? How can there be fire and there be darkness? I don't know. But God can make it happen. Mark chapter nine. Let's let's turn over there for just a moment. This I think this needs to be read. Mark chapter nine. <coughs> and we find here in Mark nine, I, I think something very interesting. And what is interesting is the repetition. In the Semitic way of doing things, repeti repetition is done for emphasis. And we have here a, generally done for emphasis, and here we have a super amount of that. Verse 43, and it says, If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better thee for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off, and it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. Where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out, and it is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than to having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and their fire is not quenched. Now, this is not to be taken literally in the sense that you should mutilate yourself. What the idea here is, is it is so bad that if you did this, if you cut, if you cut off your, uh, your foot, if you cut off your hand, if you gouged out your eye, and that, that enabled you to go to heaven as opposed to hell, it would be worth it. Just the idea of how bad. Thrown into hell is used, or the, the idea is three times. The fire not being quenched is five times. The worm not dying is three times. This is great emphasis. Now, what does it mean the worm died not? Well, I'm going to give you a theory, okay? Uh, we don't, I think that this means, some people say, oh, it means you're going to have a worm. Now, I don't think so. I think that this means your, your consciousness. Your thinking as you have it today will remain with you. Your lusts, your addictions, 
they will continue to be an issue. You know, they say that a drug addict only has one problem. That's how to get his next fix. And there will be people there. Of course, there's no, there are no fixes there. But whatever it is that they are addicted to, their, their, uh, their addiction, whatever it may be, I think it continues into the next life. Their lusts. The word lust in the New Testament is the word epi to me. Epi is an intensifying um, suffix. I mean, excuse me, a pre prefix. And so it means a strong desire. A desire that causes a person to do things that they wouldn't do if it was just a little bit of a desire. You know, I tell people, if there's nothing you want, take your pulse. You may be dead. But it, when, when it becomes a, 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 a moving desire, one that causes you to do things that should not be done, that is lusts. Consciousness. They never, ever lose their consciousness. I think there are regrets there. Regrets of lost opportunities. What could have been? That day, a person turns their back on the gospel and walks out and says, oh, I'll have none of that. I'm not interested. I'm not interested. Uh, maybe later, maybe later. You know, just before I die. Well, when you're going to die, you don't know. Post not thyself tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forward. Of their guilt. Of their guilt. Do you know that there are people that are insane? The reason the psychological industry really can't help people is because sometimes what's going on is of a spiritual nature. And there's nothing they can do for that. I read a book one time about adult children of alcoholics and the lady diagnosed the, 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 everything perfectly. She gave all the symptoms but she had no real answers. The guilt will never go. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell. It says, being in torments. In verse 24, he said, he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. If we look one, one page ahead, one page back toward the end of the book of Revelation, we see in, in, in chapter 21 and verse 8, it says, But the fearful and the unbelieving and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and adulterers and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. It tells us that death and hell will be dumped into the lake of fire. In other words, all the awful characteristics of death and of hell will be there. Now, interesting thing, in Matthew chapter 25, it says, Then shall we say unto them, that, unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Prepared for the devil and his angels, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. If heaven is forever, hell is too. Amen. If heaven never, the joys of heaven never end, then the torments of the lake of fire do not either. And you say, Pastor, Whatever objection you make, they're all invalid. They're all without foundation. God Himself has made a way. You know, so, so, sometimes, sometimes we're so close to Christianity we don't see it. it to me, it, it, it is an astounding thing that God Himself should come 
and suffer as he did for his creation. Now, God has done all that can be done. God cannot violate his holiness. And so he had to make a sacrifice that satisfied that holiness. And so at Calvary, the love of God was satisfied and the holiness of God is satisfied. Now, if God be satisfied, who are you to object? Who are you to determine that there can be another way? As you sit there this afternoon, this shortly after me, do you know that you have eternal life? First John says, These things have I written unto you to believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Let's parse that real quickly. These things were written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, these things have I written to you that have trusted in the Son of God eternal life that you may know that you have. It's found one place. But Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father. It is because it is very true. You know, when it comes to religion, people get silly. They really do. They get silly. You know, in, 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 in life, there's one right answer to so many Thing. You do a math problem. There's one right answer. And I know sometimes there, there, there are people who say, well, you know, we should give them effort. Well, I don't know. You know, man, when I was, a, when I was coming up, I, I, my teacher had a big, had a red pen. It was kind of brutal, don't you think, teacher? Well, that was wrong. That was wrong. You say, well, that's not very nice. Well, you know what? You ever play with? Have you ever worked with the less electricity? I had a roommate in college that about three years after uh, he was not my roommate anymore, he died. He got electrocuted. His dad was an electrician. I had a next door neighbor. I always remember his birthday. It's October fifth, Larry Hatcher's birthday. Fell off a roof. Died. Take the wrong medicine. Died. All kinds of things. There's a right and there's a wrong. Jesus is the only way because He's the only one who could make that sacrifice and please the Father. Now folks, God is in control. Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions. Who do you suppose God lets into this house? Not only was God's holiness satisfied in Calvary, not only was God's love satisfied in Calvary, but the foot of the cross is level. It's level. Everybody must do the same thing. They must repent of their sin. See that their sin is wrong, that it's, it's not a good thing, that it's taking them in the wrong direction. Repent of that sin and trust in Jesus Christ. He that trusteth in the Son has life. And he that trusteth not the Son of God shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. Do you have that life? It's all for two. Just like to the to a nine, nine year old little boy named me called me and decided it was stupid to reject God's salvation. And so I received it. And it's offered to you. This is, you know, folks, that in one respect, this is a situation that's better for the common man than for the the guy, the woman, the man that's up the totem pole, up the food chain a little farther because Jesus said not many not said that it's, it's very difficult for the rich very difficult for the rich it's yours if you want it but if you don't God has told you what awaits
bow our heads, close our eyes.